Welcome to Brave. Be inspired by the best leaders of Southeast Asia tech. Build the future, learn from our past, and stay human in between. I'm Jeremy Ao, a VC, founder, and father. Join us for transcripts, analysis, and community at www.jeremyao.com. Hey, Zi Shuang. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Jeremy. Yeah, I'm so excited to uh, not only feature, obviously, your great thought leadership on Southeast Asia, but also hear who you are and uh, go deeper into your perspective on Southeast Asia. Yeah, excited to share. For those who don't know you yet, tell us a little bit about yourself. I spent most of my career as an entrepreneur, probably about seven, eight years, and in about 2019, I joined Circles Life as the country launcher. Uh, the market I launched was the Taiwan market. Lots of learning over there. And after that, um, probably for the last two months or so, I've been spending some time writing. The reason why is I think I've collected a lot of thoughts on the industry, which is uh, startup land in general, tech startups, with a focus on Southeast Asia. The reason why is there's a lot of thought leadership and a lot of opinions out there, but it's mostly related to the West. And when I say the West, I actually probably mean North America, right? And uh, because most of your writers are from the Valley, even Europe, you don't have too much going on. And in terms of Asia, the people who write are journalists. And I don't think you get too many professional journalists writing on startup either. Most of your professionals end up in your Bloomberg or your Wall Street Journal. And I can see why, because probably they pay better, right? And I don't fault them for doing that. Um, what happens is the quality of writing comes from a person who hasn't really done anything. How this first struck me, right, was I noticed how sports commentators, yeah, those who have been athletes or coaches, the insight they provide is a lot more interesting than a professional commentator, a talking head, so to speak, right? And I thought myself, maybe I can give it a shot. I'm not the best writer out there, but at least I have the inside perspective. Awesome. And you do have that inside perspective as a founder, as a market launcher. Uh, tell us what it means to be an insider. Like, you know, the, what experiences from your, you know, career would you say particularly inform the way that you write? I think if you read your general tech blogs, they tend to cover topics which make for good headlines, like the largest funding rounds, right? But for someone who's just starting out as a founder, right, or a tech executive, like launching a new product, that's not very useful. I mean, it's cool that like, you know, Grab just raised a billion dollars, or they're talking about how are they going to scale throughout Southeast Asia and all the problems doing that. But that's not applicable to like 99.5% of us, right? That's why I started off with your first thousand users, because that is the problem that 90% of founders um, face. Um, my next one, I like to have an extension of that. Like, How do you scale after you get your first thousand users? How do you um, deal with retention? I also had another article uh, that did decently well, which was your first dollar in, in terms of funding. and. Again, the reason why I, I wrote about that is because that is the problem that 90% of founders face. Um, most of us don't really care about the $100 million rounds because we, we are quite far from it, if I were to be honest. Awesome. So I think what's interesting is you're saying that your experience as a founder lets you not only think about the problems differently, but also have a taste for different headlines. Right? And I agree with you because a lot of what we see uh, in the regional tech blogs uh, are very much either press releases uh, <laughs> with a tin code <laughs> of, uh, you know, in a one or two paragraphs to say, and they had previously raised X and Y, Z money, or, you know, it's a very, um, what called landscape views, which are very good for people who are new to the sector or new to the geography, but doesn't really kind of like hold up to deeper tastes, you know, and I'm not saying that they don't add value, they do add value, but I think you just have to remember, like, I think they're good for fast, fast news, and they're also good for breath news, right? But they're not deep. And I like what you have been writing a lot, and that's what 
struck me a lot uh, was, you know, the way you wrote deeply. And your first article that seemed to go viral, at least within the tech sector, was your first 1,000 users. So can you tell us a little bit more about your thinking process behind writing that? And then later on, we'll talk a little bit about how that distribution thing kind of kicked off. But how did you go about creating it? Uh, well, to be honest, um, there's a writer in the US. Uh, he was a former PM at Airbnb. His name's, uh, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his last name correctly, Lenny Rachitsky. He has a blog called Lenny Sun, and I've been following it. He's been writing some pretty useful stuff. And he did write about uh, how do you get your first thousand users. But when I looked at it, right, I think the way a lot of American companies or startups, so to speak, collect their first thousand users. It's very different from how we do it in Southeast Asia, right? What's the difference? They, they tend to have a lot of very smart hacks, quote unquote, so to speak, right? And in Southeast Asia, we are a bit more brute force and we really like you know, have to run extra fast. That is the end result. The reason why I'm not too sure, if I were to speculate, I think it's because we have a pretty nascent scene down here, and that means our talent pool isn't as deep, right? And in the US, they have probably like what, for 60 years by now of developing Silicon Valley. Yeah. So it's gone through many iterations and the talent pool has been recycled over and over again. So you have a lot of guys and girls out there who can think very deeply, they can draw from different experiences. But for us, uh, my, myself included, by the way, you just have to like really brute force it, right? And just figure everything out. and. Uh, try everything that, that, that works or doesn't work. Although like, and most of our stuff isn't that new or creative, I would to be honest, but that is fine uh, because at the end of the day, right? You just have to do what works. And I think what we need out there is something that's more contextual to our region. And if founders are just reading what writers from Silicon Valley write and try to action on that, uh, I think it, most of the time it ends up in tears. I find most of my learnings actually is from conversations with other tech executives, other founders, other operators, basically, people who have done it in that area. Because Southeast Asia, as we know, in terms of economic development, in terms of taste and preferences of consumers, in terms of how the technologies have developed, is very, very different from the US. And I don't think we can use what's worked over there to apply to what is going to work over here. Any pet peeves around, you know, US <laughs> advice that doesn't localize well or apply well? So I think a lot of advice out there is about choosing your found, uh, your investors, right? And the thing is, is in Silicon Valley, they have like, what, 100 over VCs, maybe a few hundred. But like when I started out probably about close to 10 years ago, we had like 10 or 20. And I remember I was joking with a friend, right? We were reading about... I think it was Airbnb where the founder was saying something like, oh yeah, we had to talk to like 70, 80 investors before we closed that round. And me and my friend were like, man, if we had 70 or 80 investors to talk to, <laughs> it would be a very different story. I mean, now the, you have a lot more VCs down here. I think you probably have at least 50 or 60. But at the same time, it's, it's a fraction of like, you know, what's available in the Valley. The options the founders have here isn't, the same as in Silicon Valley. I think it's changing already, it's changing rapidly, but um, that goes to show them the level of development in terms of the ecosystem is very different, right? And if that's the case, you cannot apply those lessons. For, it's just the same as you can't take the lessons of a developed country to apply to a third world nation. And uh, not to get too much into politics there, but when America preaches like, you know, the uh, political systems to countries like, um, Haiti, you see what happens over there, right? Yeah, that's a very fair point. And not only is the pool, you know, different, and I think obviously Southeast Asia has deepened in terms of pool as VCs, but America at the same time has also accelerated in its pool of venture capital at the same time. So I think the relative gap still exists, right? <laughs> um, so I think a lot of fundraising advice kind yeah. of like assumes uh, that very deep pool of VCs, uh, but also I think also, I think a deep pool of VCs actually creates uh, some interesting spread where on average, I believe that it creates more competition for VC capital within VC firms. And it also creates more good faith behavior. It creates more information symmetry 
uh, across uh, the markets. Um, mm. And that's not necessarily true in Southeast Asia at a regional level, let alone I think if you go into like, uh, you know, outside Singapore, Indonesia, if you're going to like, you know, the smaller markets, then, you know, the pool gets much more shallow very quickly. And then the uh, information asymmetry kind of grows very fast, right? And so I think a lot of that That's true. advice, assuming, you know, information symmetry, good faith actors, deep VC pools kind of end up flying out the window <laughs> a little bit. Uh, so I think it's just better to be aware rather than not aware. And I think this is not really talked about, right? Yeah. And not only that, I think this is changing very rapidly as well, but uh, probably about seven, eight years ago, most venture capitalists were not formal operators. Most of them were consultants or bankers who managed to raise a fund. And um, although I know the data suggests differently, but from a more anecdotal perspective or more personal experience as a, as a founder raising money, uh, when you talk to a venture capitalist who was an operator and who wasn't an operator is world of difference. And that's why I think you have a fund like Monk's Hill Ventures, right? Where it's very operator heavy or even stays on capital. The, um, the empathy for founders is very different and the kind of advice they can give the founders is very different as well. Yeah, I think it's basically the function of specialization, right? Which is, I think there's a lot of great VCs that are specializing based on certain domain expertise. So size on for FinTech uh, on a global stage, right? Uh, and they have the supporting LP, which is, you know, uh, uh, credit size on the support as well. So I think there's yeah. a very deep stack where they all reinforce each other, right? You know, a single LP, there's a financial institution backing a fintech focused fund that is allowed to therefore specialize without too much concern about immediate return. Um, allows them to be very helpful to founders who need that fintech angle um, and have the empathetic advice. And then, you know, I think for Monk Hill, I think the interesting thing is that, you know, I was attracted to them because they were all former operators. I wouldn't have joined, honestly, if I mm. didn't hear that initial message uh, about the importance of being founder friendly um, and also the good reputation I had heard about them from other founders as well. Uh, and I think going in, one interesting thing was understanding that, you know, one way to look at them is like, it doesn't specialize, it specializes on Southeast Asia. Um, and I think that's actually underweighted, mm -hmm. right? Because, you know, like it's a regional VC, but everybody in the team is Southeast Asian. Uh, and that makes a huge difference, I think, because, you know, there are regional VCs that are, don't have that deep root on Southeast Asia. And so they don't have that local context. And then the second specialization that exists is the founder component. And it doesn't show up so nicely on the stage because, you know, every VC will state that they are founder friendly and, you know, understand founders. Of course. <laughs> but I think, you know, yeah. <laughs> of course. But I mean, you got to look at a profile of who's actually talking to you across the table, right? You know, like, have they actually had founder experience or not, right? And if they do, they can do that. And if they don't, they can't, right? You know, is this, um, and what's interesting is how it shows up in different ways, right? I think it shows up not on a nice slide to be like, these are the five things we can value at, but it shows up as, understanding this is a fundraising is tough, you know, and therefore I should not waste your time, right? Understanding that uh, <laughs> you are the subject matter expert on your company and to some extent your domain, and therefore I should know when I should shut up <laughs> and just tell you the stuff I, you know, prioritize my advice and say, this is stuff I know versus stuff I don't know by read, which is actually really important. Uh, and then thirdly, you know, it's just like, Yes. Understanding that startups are tough and therefore I shouldn't be an asshole. I should always approach from, you know, a position of like empathy, right? Um, and that doesn't show up nicely mm. on a slide. And I, I think it's, you know, it's like, honestly, I always tell people, it's like, as a first time founder, I'm not sure if I would have valued that uh, set of specializations mm -hmm. um, because, you know, I was very focused mm -hmm. on maximizing uh, financial return, right? Uh, in the sense of, you know, it's much easier to tell... Mm -hmm if you're diluting 25% versus diluting 20% versus diluting, you know, 18%, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's stuff that shows up well on a blank piece of paper, <laughs> not everything else. And I guess like, you know, at the end of the day, that's what the LPs care about, right? But if you look at it, right, I think in the past, you have very successful non, 
operator sort of venture capitalist. And I'm this time I'm drawing experience from uh, Silicon Valley, where you have like your Michael Moritz or your John Dewar. But now I think the kings seem to be guys like Andres and Horowitz, right? And I'm not sure why, or maybe we're both wrong on like, you know, you need to be a founder to be <laughs> a good venture capitalist. Mm. But from the founder perspective, it's definitely a lot, it's a lot more comforting. And then you feel at least that you learn a lot more when you speak to a former founder or operator. And I think like one thing we mentioned was uh, Saison Capital and something I didn't mention about myself earlier. I've recently joined their program as a venture scout. And I've got to look at things from an investor's perspective for probably about, I don't know, three or four weeks. And the feeling's really very different when you can take a very divorced view, but because it's not your company, right? All your friends' company at a startup. And you talk to your fellow scouts and the team at Saison and understand why they may or may not like a certain company, what are the incentives for them, and uh, what might work for the company might not work for them, right? And to be honest, it's pretty ironic that after I've got more involved in a venture capital firm, if I were to ever found a company again in future, I'd be very wary of taking venture capital. Not in the sense that I think venture capital is evil, but I think your incentives have to be very aligned to the venture capital firm, meaning that you have to be truly a, a fast scaling company that can hit a certain sort of valuation before you take that sort of money. But the thing is for, I know there's advice that's not that new, right? But getting like, you know, five to $10 million a year with your quote unquote small business is pretty life-changing for most people. And that's nothing to uh, spit at, right? But at the same time, if you truly are lucky, and I say lucky because I think you can work very hard, but there's still an element of luck to, hit gold, so to speak, on a certain kind of company, like a, like a Snapchat or a Facebook, right? That's where I really would take uh, venture capital. And um, I think that's uh, one connection that you and I have actually, right? Because you are a former scout as well. Yeah, I was a former scout with uh, Sizon Capital as well. And, you know, I'm also uh, good buddies with uh, Jay Yang. Uh, he was a podcast guest in an early episode. And mm. uh, also, you know, collaborated on a bunch of articles um, that we've been like, you know, helping each other with, right? Um, and I think what's interesting, like you said, is, you know, there's an interesting other side of the table, right? <laughs> you know, uh, that you get to do, right? Which is, as a scout, you kind of get to see in how the VCs are kind of thinking about, you know, company A, company B. And I think for myself, I think that was the first step. And then eventually I joined Monk's Hill <laughs> as a VC, right? So I even got even more embedded in the other side of the table. Um, one thing I'm interested in what you said was understanding whether you are the right fit for VC, right? Um, that's an interesting statement because yes. that's not a common question, right? Most com I think the most common question is how do I get VC capital? <laughs> and then the second question might be, how do I position myself to best receive and attract VC capital? I think that's the level two. And then the deeper question after that is, am I a right fit for VC, right? So, you know, it's like the three levels of Kung Fu, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> if you achieve transcendence or enlightenment when you reach level three. Uh, so, let's talk about that. What do you, what kind of, how should founders think about whether they're right fit for VC? Well, I think you have to look at the size of the fund as well, right? So, if you're raising from a $10 million fund or a $100 million fund or a billion dollar fund, the returns that your investors will expect out of you are very different. So if let's say you're supposed to rate, if let's say you're raising from a $10 million fund, you don't have to be a billion dollar company because your investors only have to return their investors like what, 30 mil, 40 mil, correct? Because uh, generally it's probably about 3X. And that number increases by an order of magnitude each time your fund gets bigger. What does that mean? So if your business is one, whereby there is a very slim chance or rather it's almost impossible for you to be a unicorn because that's what your investors need, you're going to find it very, very painful down the road. And not only that, um, I think what was very eye-opening for me was um, when I read that report, actually, that you guys came out with Glints, right? And I looked at uh, A, what founders at 
C, D stage companies pay themselves. And I was like, oh my God, um, it doesn't increase as much as I thought, right? I thought like, you know, back then when I was paying myself that pittance that I, I won't even mention, uh, that, that would change as, I, <laughs> as you raise more money, but it doesn't change as much as uh, I thought it would. And the opportunity cost is very high given that, to be honest, you can raise a, a lot of money. You can get your company to near unicorn value and the whole thing can still come tumbling down. And I'm not talking about something where it's an off chance, but like, you know, there is still a good chance that your company may not get anywhere. And the reason why, especially in Southeast Asia, is because uh, there's just not many to, uh, opportunities for exits. And once you get past a certain stage, you have to IPO. And if you're not making those sort of revenues, do you really want to IPO? Do you dare to show everyone your, your figures? I, I think the, these are some things that founders need to consider. But I think the reason why a lot of founders instinctively think of getting venture capital, right? is because it is a quote unquote easy way to get your first bunch of money and, and to get resources and to pay yourself a living wage. And I've gone through that myself, so I'm not uh, shitting on it. I'm coming fr from a very empathetic point of view that it is a pretty shitty experience, right? right? When you're eating ramen literally and your friends with investment banker salaries are doing what they do and you just want to be able to survive that's why you go out and raise venture capital but one way to think about it is um if your business can't even make enough money to provide you a decent living is it really something that's worth doing and this is where the situation differs from southeast asia and the us right in the us you have the opportunity to build a facebook of sorts whereby you can scale and scale and scale not make a lot of money, but eventually have an exit. But having said that, Facebook may not be the best example because from what I understand, they were actually making money from pretty early on from ads and all. And Zuck is actually a lot more conservative than what a lot of people think. Yeah. Well, what are your thoughts about that? A lot of thoughts. Um, yeah, you know, I think... <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I think the big one is, I think you're totally fair, which is I think, you know, founders say like, okay, I want to set up a startup and therefore I need to go out and raise venture capital. And I need to quit my job. And I'm like, hold up. <laughs> you know, when my friends ask me that question, I say, do you need to quit your job right now? Uh, you know, could you test some milestones, experiment, figure out point A to point B at least um, before you make that jump, right? Because, you know, you draw a salary and yeah, you know, you can, you know, don't do a hobby over the weekend, <laughs> you know, uh, and use that time to de-risk uh, the company. Uh, to the point of whether you decide, like you said, whether the company is worth being a venture capital funded path or not, let alone product market fit, right? Uh, so uh, I think that's, you know, I think a lot of people kind of like box themselves into saying like the only kind of startup that exists is a venture backed one. And therefore I need to quit my job to be venture backed and therefore run a startup. And I'm like, whoa, there's a lot of conflation. And I think that's why I like about your articles is because the way that you cr increase the level of, um, resolution on the founding year of uh, startups in terms of their first thousand users, in terms of their first dollars in, actually helps disaggregate those mm -hmm. conflations that are often conflated at the media level. Because for them, you know, it's like, oh, this guy's a unicorn. So I'm not going to write two, three paragraphs on how like he did this first three months before that, before beating his co-founder, before hitting a certain number of traction before hitting a certain level of ramen profitability, before he raised proper VC capital, right? Like, like that's like six months to one year of time that everyone's just going to like hand wave uh, over. And I think a lot of people do F4 end up consuming that chunk, that distillation and say like, I got to do all those things together. And I'm like, whoa, like, you know, nobody says, okay, you know, you're an amateur, you know, you have never scuba dive before. And the only way for you to scuba dive professionally is to quit your job. And then jump straight into, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like I don't know, go some way, right? And then this is gold diving, you know, by yourself. It's like yes. that's a bad combo, right? It's like you know, then the professionals all be like, whoa, 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 hold up, right? You need to go do your party one, party two, you know, like you know, there's a bunch of stuff, and you increase your res resolution, party one. It's like 
you have the boring classroom lecture about you know oxygen and da da da, see your gear, and then there's the they teach you about gear checks, and they put you in a swimming pool. <laughs> you know, I think that's that level of resolution I like about your writing. Thank you, and I think I like to add on to that point about not quitting your job and giving up your salary, right? I think the common thought out there is if you don't quit your job, you can't focus on your startup, et cetera. But not to say that's not true. But at the same time, if you're drawing a salary, you're probably in a more stable psychological state to make better decisions. That's totally true. And I think one way I think about it is one interesting thing is that friends often tell me like, hey, I've got six months of saving run rate. Therefore, it's enough time to run a startup. You know, the better oh, very bad idea. one year. And I'm like, whoa, like, you really quit your job? Are you sure? Like, that's not enough, right? And they're like, whoa, what do you mean by not enough? Like, six months is so long, I can totally crush, you know, two company initiatives within six months, right? Uh, And I'm very much like, well, you know, firstly, you know, you, you assume you can live at a lower cost of living. But, you know, I think it's tough, right? I think to really do that. But two as well, you know, it's hard to predict what milestones you need to do and whether you actually achieve those milestones within a time frame uh, to be successful, uh, because you know your experiments may fail, uh, and then it takes more time than you'd expect. And then thirdly, it's you know it takes time, right? I mean, even if you succeed in within say three to six months of de-risking the milestones, it may take you three months to fundraise, right? You know, as you get your head around it, which is a giant pain, and then that blows out your timeline. And then on Converse side, it's like when you start drawing down your savings down to like, say, the three-month level, you know, you actually tell yourself like, hey, I need to start looking for a job, right? Uh, and <laughs> you start looking for a job, that takes away even more time from the fundraising and the company building process, right? And so as a result, people often kind of like die at that stage uh, <laughs> because, you know, just under budgeted the, the, the final transition of the three months, right? Um, and they end up quitting the startup. So I think it's a common problem. I think not just that. I think people tend to underestimate how much time software development takes and the amount of problems that would just crop up, right? And what's the the best part is even the developers will underestimate what they themselves can achieve. (laughs) So I usually tell people just whatever your developers say is just, just double the amount of time to play safe. And usually that's probably not even enough. Yeah, that's so true. What advice do you normally give to founders who are, you know, kicking off a you know, new venture, a new stage? For first time founders, I think the usual problem is A, they totally underestimate everything that we just talked about, especially development time. And B, I I just don't understand why like, you know, with all the amount of literature out there, right? People will still have this belief in their head that the idea that is in their head and what maybe they've observed anecdotally will sort of work. And they don't tend to validate their ideas enough. A lot of times for fear of their idea being stolen. I think that's a very low hanging fruit in the sense that like, you know, if let's say you can even do that, I think you're better than 50% of founders already, first time founders. And the second thing I think it's easy to say, but very hard to do. I think even for myself, to be honest, is to be just very customer focused, right? I think you have a lot of founders out there who obsess over what their competitors are doing. And I, I, I truly honestly do think that for most products out there, if let's say you can develop something that your customer truly loves, half the time, your your competitors probably won't even touch you, right? Yeah, I think one thing that was interesting about what you said was really about the fact that it takes a lot of work and a lot of help (laughs) to get stuff done. And if you ask everyone to you know, sign NDAs and not share your idea, et cetera. I think you just close yourself off from so much help and help is much more valuable at, at a founding stage um, than anything else, even like money, honestly, at that stage. Agreed. And not only that, I think what I'm doing right now at the same time is just repeating a lot of 
advice that's out there. But I think at the end of the day, that's the thing with advice, right? A lot of advice tends to cycle itself. The hardest thing is for the person to actually do it. But uh, what I'm about to say is that a lot of times you should just uh, launch early, right? Because you just don't know what works, especially for consumer startups or what doesn't work for that matter. Do you think Southeast Asian founders, you know, accept <laughs> advice less or is it because of the fact that a lot of the advice seems very American centric? Do you think that's the reason why, you know, we end up repeating ourselves and maybe having a more Southeast Asian face, localizing that knowledge will make it easier for founders to swallow? In my experience, at least, I don't think that Southeast Asian founders accept advice any less than their American counterparts or their European counterparts. Is that, is that what you've absor- uh, observed, at least anecdotally? Yeah, I think that was maybe a poorly framed question uh, and assumption there. I would say that I think advice is better when it comes from someone who has similar experience uh, and is able to contextualize that to the region, right? Um, you know, is this the difference between well-framed and position advice versus what seems like irrelevant or out of touch advice, right? And I think that's something that, you know, you wrote about your first 1,000 users. Uh, it felt like a great way to contextualize and felt much more effective, I would say, as advice in getting your first 1,000 users uh, compared to uh, new and American articles that say the same thing over and over again. Yes, uh, that's true. One of the interesting things is that uh, you've transitioned from not just you know, being a founder and operator, but also a content creator and writer of what you've observed in startups. How has that been going for you? been going pretty well to be honest um maybe let me just share a little bit as to why i started writing i would say there are a few reasons one of them would be to structure my thoughts a little bit more and i was hoping once i put out my thoughts i would get some good feedback which i have and number two i think there is some value as to creating a bit of an online following I've gotten a lot of interesting conversations. And interestingly, a lot of people have reached out to me to either ad- advise their startups or to invest in their startups, which is quite a new experience for me because usually as a founder or as an operator, you're the one doing the reaching out. So you've not only been a founder and operator, now you're a writer as well with some really uh, decent writing that has gone viral in the South Circles with your analysis on how people get their first thousand users, how they get their first checks in, uh, NFTs, uh, and everything from a Southeast Asian angle. Uh, tell us more about your journey for that ride. Thanks for the kind words mm-hmm. there. I would say there are two reasons as to why I started writing. The first one would be to structure my thoughts a little bit more, put it out there and see what feedback I get. And the second reason would be, I think there's a little bit of value to building an online community and following. I'm not sure what the value is yet, but it's a wait and see sort of approach. And it's been interesting. Uh, one interesting thing is that right now I have people just reaching out to me randomly to either invest or to mentor their startups. Second interesting thing is I've got a lot of interesting conversations out of this uh, writing thing. I have people writing in, and wanting to share their opinions a bit more privately. And this has extended into hours of like, you know, conversation offline. And I think the benefit I'm getting out of that is I could look for potential collaboration in different things, or perhaps like, you know, you could get me an interesting venture next, or maybe a new role of a new company. I don't know, because I'm at this stage of uh, exploration. So I think this writing thing has been immensely beneficial to me. And number two, I think what's been interesting as well is to see the kind of articles that are more popular with different people. I think what surprised me is the articles that I didn't think would do that well have done a lot better than the articles that I thought would do a bit better. And what is the difference? I think the articles that I thought would do better are those that have gone made where I put a bit more thought and gone a bit more in-depth. But the ones that do better actually are the ones that are more easy to read and are easy to skim. And if you really think about it, that shouldn't be too surprising. And when I was thinking about this, 
it actually reminded me of a John Mayer interview. And he was talking about the songs that became hits and the songs that uh, didn't become hits. And what he realized was that the songs that he thought were really good are those that he put a lot of thought into and he thought they were really deep. But you can't expect that to be a hit because what becomes popular is what is easily digestible to the masses, right? And if that's the case, he had to dumb down the songs a bit, be a bit more poppy. And those were the songs that became hits for him. And I was thinking, yeah, actually, the I wouldn't put myself as like, you know, a big time writer or anything, but among my small sample size, the ones that have done well are those that uh, have clear ideas in, maybe you can call it clickbaity in the titles, like five ways to get your investor or like, you know, five, five ways to get your first uh, 1,000 followers. And once you tag on like, you know, big companies that catches people's attention. And the one that was my biggest hit, as I mentioned to you earlier, was my very first article. The one where I talked about how the biggest unicorns in, in Southeast Asia got their first thousand users. And I think why it did well was because that's the problem that most people face, right? Most startup founders, how do you get your first thousand users? It's not about how you get your first hundred thousand or your first million. It's really get, getting your first thousand proper users who are active and really like your product. I think that was that Ke Kelly Campen or something where he wrote this article that went viral in Silicon Valley about finding your first thousand true users. And I think that's because that's the problem that most uh, founders face. And it resonates with them. And yeah. So that's interesting uh, about the difference between what readers want versus what you want to write, uh, which is, I think, uh, the crime that every artist performs uh, in order to make it there, right? I think there's always this uh, tension. So what do you think it is that Southeast Asian readers want to read? What aspects do you think it is? I think at the end of the day, people want to read things that they can relate to. And as we discussed earlier in the podcast, most articles out there is written for the big markets. And especially if you're an English reader, it's all a very American, a very Californian sort of context. Southeast Asian readers want to read about companies, products that, that they can relate to and what they see around them. And the sources that we have right now cover these companies and products on a very slightly more narrow focus. And that narrow focus tends to be around fundraising and founder stories, which are probably cobbled together by their PR team, right? And <laughs> well, what, what readers want to read is what's actionable to them and deep analysis, which I think some people have written, not, uh, not myself yet, on Southeast Asian companies. When you do your research, what has struck you as the most surprising out of everything that you've written? I think something we talked about earlier. I would say it's my second article when I was looking at founders of the most successful companies in Southeast Asia. And the story is very different from the ones in Silicon Valley. So what is the difference down here? And I think this is a little bit more counterintuitive as to what the tech media tends to portray out there. And the difference is that most of these founders actually self-funded their very first dollar, even up to like your, your first 50 or $100,000, right? Singapore dollars. And it's not the same as in the US where you kind of have an idea and you raise your first half a million dollars and then you start scaling out. And there could be a multitude of reasons for this, mainly because the most successful companies that were founded or the most successful companies today were founded probably anywhere from five to eight years ago, right? Grab is like what, an eight-year-old company, nine-year-old company? And during that time, the ecosystem was a lot less developed. And venture capitalists weren't as confident in putting out risky dollars. I think things are changing a lot right now when you're looking at $1.5 million seed rounds with sometimes not even much of a product, right? And that's very different from the landscape back then when <laughs> even if you have a product and some traction and you see like, you know, one $200,000 rounds, things have changed a lot in the last, mm. I'd say five to eight years. 
so I think if we revisit this topic, probably in about five to eight years time, we're going to have a very different conversation altogether. Southeast Asia is probably going through um, different iterations and versions of a development as a startup ecosystem. Because if you look at Silicon Valley, they've had like what, uh, five, six, seven, eight sort of iterations. If you track all the way back to the 50s when they started with uh, the chip processes and everything, right? And things started accelerating a lot more during the internet era. And that's been the most counterintuitive thing for me. If you looked at the background of the founders, they all tend to either come from wealth or they tend to have very well-paying jobs. And that's why they can take that risk, right? And to put in that capital and go without salary for about a year or two. Yeah, so that's the, the most counterintuitive thing. I'd love to see what would be the most successful companies in about five to eight years time. And doing that same study, evaluating the founders, what were their first round like? What was the whole process like? I think it's going to be very, very different, to be honest. Yeah, is it really that counterintuitive that if you're well off, that's easier to, you know, probably correlated with, you know, on average, better education, better networks, uh, better ability to get funding either of your own or true friends or family or, or out of your own pocket? Well, if you look at the American and the, and the Chinese story, right, you have a lot of founders who are dirt poor. I guess Steve Jobs, like, you know, didn't start with a lot of money. Uh, I guess your Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos, like, you know, they were well off, yes. Uh, Elon Musk uh, co co uh, cobbled his way through. I can't remember well, who was that Chinese founder, but I, th I think it was Mei Tuan or something. There's this guy, like, he left his village and went to Beijing with, like, 500 renminbi and, like, 70 yeah. eggs or something like that. So that's a very, very different narrative from Southeast Asia. Yeah, I think it's a very different narrative. I think that in the law of large numbers, I think there's always some good stories there. And I think uh, everybody well off also works very hard to portray themselves <laughs> as, you know, coming from, you know, it's, you know, it's the joke about every politician, right? Every politician <laughs> is the son of a taxi driver uh, and, you know, eats at a hawker center, right? <laughs> and then everyone's kind of like, well... Sure, but you missed out A, B, but part of your story, right? You know, um, so there's a lot of rewriting of history, I think. Um, That's true. I think like, don't believe whatever you read, yeah? Including what I write. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think what's interesting about that article is that you actually went deeper to it and it feels very different. Uh, and, I, and I've shared this to you. I thought that was a much stronger article because it is contrary to what most people believe happened for the fundraising journey and how the first checks happened for these companies, like uh, Grab and other, uh, you know, companies that you looked at, right? And to some extent, it's quite different from what the, the mainstream media kind of portrays it as, as well. Uh, not out of, you know, uh, commission, but, you know, just out of omission, right? Uh, and so I thought that was the interesting part that you wrote. Um, well, thanks. And I think that goes back to one thing, maybe you found that interesting, but the general reader didn't find it as interesting. I don't know why. Maybe because it, it didn't um, suit the narrative that they're used to. Maybe it's not something that was as clickable. And that's the thing about media nowadays, right? It kind of feels like the headline's more important than the content itself. I don't know. Did you, did you kind of feel that way? Ooh. So let's brainstorm some articles together. So let's... So it sounds like you're saying that, you know, Jeremy's a hoity-toity person <laughs> who, you know, reads, uh, you know, uh, these articles with a cup of tea and a pinky out and I'm not the mainstream reader, okay? All right, so, so what are some, like, uh, headlines you think would work well? So let's brainstorm. How about um, seven uniquely Southeast Asian growth hacks? How about that? Is, is that? is that a good title? No. I think you want to look at what founders, the problems founders really face, right? And you want to look at who your audience is. I think if it's something along those lines, it'll probably be like seven hacks to raise your first round of angel funding. In Southeast Asia. Seven hacks on how to get your first in Southeast Asia. And if you want to localize it even more, right? Because Southeast, the thing about Southeast Asia is really a very diverse region, right? It's not like the US or anything, or even like the EU. So what I would do is, Seven things Indonesian angel mm. investors are looking for, or probably like 10 hacks that startup founders in Singapore have 
raise their first hundred thousand uh, dollars through something along those lines. So you wouldn't even use Southeast Asia. You would use like no, a for, country. for this one. Yes, if you want to get like if let's say your goal is to get the most number of clicks. But for me, that was never really the case, right? For me, it was really just to put my thoughts out there and to, I don't know, talk to hoity-toity people. <laughs> like you and I was like, let's go more hoity-toity in this conversation, right? <laughs> let's ascend the ears. <laughs> you know? Yeah, and I think I kind of achieved my goals in that sense because right. yeah. I think that's how we met in the first place, right? Which which article was it that uh, you noticed? I, I can't remember. I'm not sure if you do. I read a thousand users for sure. Uh, but when I read it, it didn't feel very... Um, you know, I call it... I, so there's, there's a genre of uh, trend that I call um, success pornography. Uh, you know. Uh, <laughs> and, and it's always a story <laughs> about, like, you know, like... It's all the same, right? It's like, you know, the, it, it's very, like, the one thing that entrepreneurs do... Uh, you know, kind of thing, right? Or like, you know, it's a bit of like hustle porn, I think they call it as well, right? Hustle uh, porn. But it's very like, if you hustle hard enough, you can do it, which I think is so true. You have to hustle. Uh, I just don't like the part where they make it feel like that's the only reason they succeeded. Um, and and I think it just plays to what people already believe. Um, and yeah, maybe it's just like, again, maybe I'm just being hoity-toity, but I'm just like uh, trying to be like, whoa, like, I, I I like the techniques they describe, but I'm not sure about what a key takeaway is because it's a little bit more complex or full featured than that, right? So I think when you wrote the you know the first uh, number of users, I thought that was really good from a landscape perspective. Uh, but it, and and I think it was very fair treatment of it. I wasn't I wasn't thinking it was a, any kind of like hustle porn or anything. Uh, but it was just like when I read it, I was very much like, okay, I've seen this again in, and it's a lot of like what I call like. Uh, you know, it's very similar to what you see in Silicon Valley, et cetera, right? But I think your first check-in article was much more uh, contrarian, I would say, to what the popular perception is. And also, I think, very uniquely Southeast Asian. So I thought that was a much stronger article from my perspective. At least that's my my two cents. Uh, I'm sure lots of people felt differently, maybe. No, thanks for the feedback. And to, to be honest, I think it comes down to, again, why uh, why the person wants to write. And I don't work for uh, Tech in Asia or anything where the goal is to maximize yeah. your number of readers. Uh, for me, uh, I'm really yeah. just trying to get to the right people. At the end of the day, it's uh, more writing for myself. Uh, but you brought up an interesting point about the whole hustle porn thing whereby people believe as long as you work hard, you're going to make it. But that's not the truth, right? Especially in entrepreneurship. And especially if, let's say, you're trying to build a consumer tech sort of company where a huge element of luck is involved. And I think you can debate all day whether it's 50% luck or 80% luck. I don't think there's any real way to prove it. But at the end of the day, it's it's something that comes into play. And second of all, if you're born into the right family with the right connections or you go to the right schools, uh, that tends to help a lot. And if you tend to study like all these founders who make it, there is that common thread among them. Uh, I'm not sure if things are going to change anytime down the road. It happens because it's a very easy thing to produce, right? You know, uh, you know, came from nothing and then figured X out became something, right? It, the storyline writes itself, right? And well, not even figures, it's figure something out slash work really hard, right? You know, uh, it's a beautiful story. It fits in like, you know, 200 to 300 words. Uh, and I think there's also a huge demand for it because, you know, I think everybody, it even is. myself, I love reading that stuff because I'm like, okay, you know, like, you know, I've literally read articles like, you know, two things that Jeff Bezos does differently, right? And I'm like being a night owl or writing stuff in minutes instead of, you know, PowerPoint decks. And, I, you know, it's easy to consume, sure. But I think it's also very affirming uh, to read, right? So at least that's how I think about it. Well, if I'm be completely honest, that was my very first article and I was just trying to push something out. And I wasn't releasing anything in any particular order. But you've got me thinking a little bit as to why people like reading such stories. Is it because if you see a case of success, you believe you yourself can make it? You know what I'm saying? Like as, as long as I put in the work and as long as I do what they do, it is possible. And of course, the rags, the richest story is, is, is evergreen because it gives people hope, right? That they can come from nothing and get to somewhere. 
Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like what Disney for founders, right? <laughs> <laughs> I love the way it's you like the happily ever after. <laughs> <laughs> it's like happily ever after, right? Um, I mean, but I mean, okay. Here's a, here's an example, right? Like most VC back startups fail, right? For example, right? Yes. So it's like what ninety percent over, right? You know, um, <laughs> right? And so if you think about it, like if I read about VC back startup, ninety percent of the article should be negative, and ten percent of it should be positive, right? Just by like I'm just saying, like the you know ratio of whatever it is, right? Um, and I'm not saying that when we talk about failure, we're talking about, oh, you're a bad person or you fail, blah, 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 but more like, okay, you know, this is what happened and these are the things that we learned, A, B, and C, right? And, and if I saw that, then I would be like reading it and I'll be like, okay, I have a, I mean, I read, I don't know, that 90% of failure is from a considerate and considered and thoughtful perspective and 10% are successful. I think I have a much not only like more realistic lay of the land about my personal odds, but also I think honestly better preparation to be a successful founder, right? Because now you know how people fail and you're going to, you know, running a startup is just as much about avoiding failure as it is about pushing for success, right? Uh, and, you know, I think it, the common media component is probably the total opposite, right? It's probably like 90% success stories and 10% is evil CEO uh, dynamics, <laughs> right? You know, you know, you know, not too many incompetent, you know, slash, you know, companies growing faster than the CEO can scale versus like all kinds of like more real archetypes that happen. Yeah, it's classic survivorship bias, right? And the problem with survivorship bias, it's quite hard to get the data of startups that fail. Uh, for one, because it's quite difficult to track who failed because if they fail, you never have heard of them, right? And B, there isn't really an incentive for these failed founders to go out and tell their story. I remember back then, I'm not sure it was still going on, there's this thing called FailCon. Do you remember that? Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. What happened to them? I don't know. Uh, maybe that says something, right? I think there was this thing called Fucked Up, Fuck Up Nights as well. Um, oh, I remember those. Those were in Singapore, yeah. Oh, yes. No, was it global? Yeah. It definitely was in Singapore. I'm not sure if they had it anywhere else. And maybe people just don't want to talk about their failures because there's a penalty for it. Yeah, I think it's totally true. Um, yeah, that reminds me, I think uh, there's a Harvard business professor who focuses a lot on entrepreneurship and he just wrote a book on uh, startup failure. So Professor Eisenman definitely recommend that book. A uh, ton of great insights in his analysis on how startups fail, uh, which is most companies our founders believe is a function of competition that kills a company, but actually by statistics, it's mostly implosion, self-inflicted wounds, uh, you know, like founder departure or, you know, mismanagement, so on and so forth, as well as a speed trap, I think, which is like the mismatch of what you talked earlier about, which is uh, investor expectations versus uh, operating reality um, and kind of like not managing both sides well enough to make them part of the same reality, right? Um, so I think it's uh, something that's interesting and hopefully we get to talk more about it over time. Yeah, uh, anecdotally, I completely agree that most companies die from suicide than homicide, right? But the strange thing is that I don't know why, despite all the literature out there, you still have a lot of founders who are very afraid of their ideas getting stolen or like oh, you know, yeah. the competition is going to sure. kill them that uh, yeah. they focus more on the competition rather than like, you know, getting the company right, making sure their products like, you know, serve users, all that kind of stuff. I'm not sure whether it's a basic instinct that humans can never get over, or is it only the best founders can do that? And just being able to focus can enable you to beat 90% of the competition. Yeah, I think it just humanizes the startup struggle, right? Because it's way easier to have a competitor that you're trying to beat than it is to like achieve your personal best, right? As a company, right? you, know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's why, you know, when we watch a marathon, everyone's running it at the same time rather than, you know, letting them run their own time on target and then making, you know, it's, it's better TV. Uh, and like you said, maybe it's just human nature, right? Yeah. I guess people rather watch gladiator sports than marathons. Marathons are so boring to watch. <laughs> all the marathon fans now are just like I can't believe this this hoity-toity person writer who doesn't understand the true joy of marathon writing but yeah 
I definitely watch probably more MMA than uh, marathon fighting for sure. MMA is probably at the core of human nature. Two people <laughs> fighting. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, just stick them in a room, right? Um, you know, when you think about all this digital media and what are your thoughts about, you know, the creator economy as well, right? You know, like the rise of writers like yourself. Right. How do you feel about that trend? Long and short of it, I think the creator economy as a trend is pretty cool. I am, I think this term kind of bubbled probably in the last six months or so, right? Maybe to be generous, maybe 12 months. I am still looking at it very cautiously, but optimistically. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's value to be being part of an institution, be it if let's say you're a writer or a singer or whatever it is, because institutions are able to bring together expertise together, right? At the end right. of the day, you need the best teams to produce the best sort of products. But at the same time, I think as for the creator economy, there are two segments that have been very successful. And perhaps it's because in these segments, you don't really need a team. And the first one is the adult vertical, right? <laughs> Uh, only fans mm. really, really took off during the, uh, during the pandemic. Mm. And it probably showed you don't need a whole studio to actually provide joy to your end user. <laughs> the second one... Wow, that was <laughs> as uh, delicately framed as it could be. All right, yes. Keep going. Uh, uh, the second one are your writers, right? And the reason why is probably a lot of the times the writers... They probably, I've never been like, you know, a uh, part of a writing team. So I, I don't really know how it works, but I can assume that like, you know, going through your editor, having to craft a narrative that is uh, in line with the publication that you work with can be a very painful process. And this disintermediation has given the writers a lot of freedom. And that's why you're seeing a lot of cool stuff coming out on Substack, right? And mm -hmm. at the same time, the problem with journalism today, I think is, uh, journalists aren't compensated very well, from what I understand, unless you're working at a place like the New York Times, where you get a proper six figures or a salary. Other than that, uh, most journalists probably make, uh, I uh, just let's just say, not what their value is. But when they can go freelance and monetize directly from their audience, their audience are pretty much voting directly with their dollars. And the best journalists do get uh, compensated very well. And those that don't probably just aren't writing what people want to read about, right? Yeah, I, th I think there's a lot of truth there. And I think at the end of the day, the internet is letting people just unbundle themselves, right? I think the key thing about the writing industry is like, yeah, you know, all these writers were bundled, right? The young, aspiring writer, the pretty decent mainstream writer and the superstar writer kind of all got bundled together in the same in a blog, right, called the newspaper. Yes. <laughs> and yes. then, so you're overpaying for the junior folks, you're paying the mainstream folks, that's right, and you're underpaying the top folks, right? And now your top folks get the ability the to... <laughs> yeah, exactly. My joke in my head is like, you know, for the Straits Times, um, the superstar writer is Sumiko Tan because she's the only person that anybody <laughs> can name who is a writer on Straits Times. Like, can you think of any other person who writes the Straits Times? Uh, it's, it's effectively a big fat zero for me, you know. And, you know, so Miko Tan probably appeals to a very, you know, you know, targeted type of, you know, persona, right? Well, not to bash too much on the Straits Times, but how many people do you know pay for the Straits Times? <laughs> well, <laughs> it's like my parents and my in-laws. <laughs> and I guess I, I still subscribe for the digital subscription because of COVID. Uh, so there's enough articles for me to follow um, for the introductory offer. But I also do subscribe to Tai Sing, which is the you know Chinese uh, equivalent of uh, FT, uh, Financial Times, uh, which is you know really good business writing uh, and analytical stuff. Um, and then I do subscribe to The Economist. I've canceled my sub subscription to FT itself uh, because not too much value there. I am subscribed to Tech in Asia, uh, and the information and the can. So yeah, actually, I do subscribe to a lot of stuff. You subscribe a lot more than most people. <laughs> I subscribe to Trends, VC, and uh, 
uh, as well as probably the can as well. Okay, yeah. So maybe I need to like reevaluate my news budget. <laughs> that, that's easy, like you know, one one two hundred bucks on new subscriptions, right? Yeah, yeah. but I no, love that's reading, about so. <laughs> I guess maybe you know, I'm a hoity-toity person, you know. It's just like it's like oh, you read the Economist, okay? Oh no, <laughs> that's why you like uh, the strong writing, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, well, maybe when you tell me like you read a New Yorker, that's when I consider you a bit more hoity-toity. Which yeah, I don't read a New probably. Yorker. <laughs> or the Atlantic. I mean, obviously, I read some stuff that happens along the way, but um, not that. I mean, you know, I'm sure everybody reads New York Times when it comes up on Facebook. I mean, probably Facebook and Twitter is probably like the biggest news source for most folks, right? For uh, sure, for sure. But back to your point on the creator economy and writing, we're noticing like the top few writers making a ton of money, but at the same time, like, this is going to be like most platforms, you're going to have 1% of writers making a lot of money and the rest aren't uh, going to make anything or barely surviving at all. But the cool thing, I guess, is that this probably provides some sort of competition for the mainstream sort of publications and probably change the way they operate. How so? I'm not sure. I'm not sure whether we're really seeing the effects right now because uh, if you use America as a comparison, right? I think the New York Times, they lost quite a few uh, big-time journalists. How has that op uh, affected their publication uh, I'm not too sure. I didn't really follow that much. Did, did you? Uh, not too much. Uh, but I think there's been a lot of uh, gyrations in the market around the US around how to defend or attack versus Facebook uh, as, and then Substack and diff these other different folks. Um, actually, let's focus the conversation a little bit more. So what do you think about Straits Times? So, you know, recently, the uh, local part of a duopoly in terms of news uh, in Singapore, it's been around for, you know, what, 200 years, effectively. <laughs> and, you know, it just got nationalized into the Singapore government uh, as a company limited by guarantee. So, and then obviously there's been a lot of noises around digital disruption, the landscape, you know, there's a lot of conversation about Umbridge and the CEO. So what do you think about all of that, you know, in the context of what we're talking about? The Straits Times is a very... It's a very unique case, right? The Straits Times has traditionally been, I don't want to say a government mouthpiece, but uh, I would say it's along those lines. And its main role is to provide an avenue for the government to push a message. That's, that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? Because at the end of the day, a nation does need some sort of a coherent narrative. But at the same time, I think when this has when this has been used too aggressively on a population that is not dumb, it becomes a bit of a, a bit of a joke, right? Uh, I'm not I'm not sure how else to put it nicely, <laughs> and especially in a day and age like today, when you can get news sources anywhere in the world through the internet, as compared to when you and I were growing up when there were no other news sources and you can only speculate what's out there, right? Or maybe you can get a physical copy of the New York Times or the Economist and make a comparison. But right now, it's just so easy for anyone to see that it's making, in comparison at least, what the Straits Times has been putting out is looking more and more like a government mouthpiece. And people just don't like that, right? People don't like being told what to do inherently. And I think they're going to struggle a lot Maybe like, you know, what, what they should do is just focus on local news because that's what uh, no one else can do. Maybe they should just be uh, focusing on releasing government PR statements. Maybe that, <laughs> that, that's their role. I, I don't know. I think if they're trying to veer into anything else, it's a bit challenging. But actually, now that I think about it, maybe they should just be providing food reviews. They do that pretty well. <laughs> They do a great food review section, actually. Uh, I, I think actually, so now that you mentioned it, I do read their food reviews quite often. Right. Uh, <laughs> it's sad, but yeah. like, you know, it comes down to that's what they're good at. 
Well, it's more like, you know, every newspaper is a bundle, right? So you have your sports headlines, you have your financial news, you have your arbitraries, right? You have your government announcements, of course. You have your food reviews. You have your lifestyle section. You have your op-eds. You know, you have your reader letters. Uh, so I think it's always about a bundle, right? So our portfolio, right? You know, it's kind of like... So I wouldn't necessarily say that looking at a newspaper and say that the food reviews are good, I wouldn't actually look at it as like a backhanded compliment. I would actually say like, yeah, that's good, right? Because it's like saying like, you know, Disney has great kids movies, right? I mean, yeah, that's, you know, and it's got Mandalorian and Star Wars and, and Clone Wars, right? Which is actually a very different target audience because it's pretending to be for kids, but it's actually for like middle-aged guys <laughs> like myself. <Yes>. You know? <laughs> and, then, and I tell myself that I'm watching it for the kids, you know, just to make sure, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no, you know, it's very different, right? So, you know, I want to look at it as a, you know, backhanded compliment. I mean, but let's talk about the bias piece, right? Because, you know, it, like, you know, New York Times, you know, definitely a liberal bias in terms of social liberal and economically liberal. Everybody knows that. Um, you see, obviously, your Fox News on the other end of the scale. Um, you know, you see, obviously, past U.S. administrations kind of like um, being defensive or offense, being on attack against media that they consider like biased towards one side or the other. Um, and of course, in the middle of that, you have NPR, right, <laughs> which is also seen as a, you know biased sometimes on both sides, depending on how they're looking at it. But it's probably the closest to like a American. BBC, right? Equivalent, right? The British BBC is also has its, it's also like a public trust uh, dynamic, also has its own set of biases, obviously, very uh, pro British point of view. Uh, but, you know, strong editorial slant as well. Um, you know, we've talked about Guardian being part of a public trust. We know that SCMP um, and Tai Seng obviously have to abide by Chinese regulations around, you know, what's in bounds and what's out of bounds. Um, Al Jazeera as well has also been, you know, booted out of a couple of Middle Eastern countries for being, uh, you know, slanted one side versus the other side. So, you know, is it hypocrisy to just say like, you know, there's a slant that we don't like? I think the thing is that all the journals that you've mentioned, they, yes, they have a strong slant and so does Straits Times. But the more that I think about it, I think at the end of the day, it is the quality of writing and the quality of thought that they put out, right? And when I was thinking about what kind of quality of writing in terms of uh, social issues in a localized context, when I say localized, I mean Singapore, is actually really good. Actually, I, I'm not sure what you think about it, but I think Rice Media does a pretty good job. And interestingly, um, I went to school with the guy who founded Rice Media, uh, a few of my friends actually they they founded it and when they first started out i th i think they wanted to write something that was of good quality uh, something the straits times would never write they'll cover issues that the straits times doesn't dare because at the end of the day i think the straits times also has a bit of a moralistic slant to it some and they wouldn't cover certain issues that they're afraid would offend a certain segment of uh, traditional society in singapore like, well, if you look at Rice Media, they cover stuff in the red light district or trans issues. I don't think that's something that you see the Straits Times ever cover. And at the end of the day, um, people nowadays have a ton of things to read about and people aren't going to settle for bland sort of news, right? If uh, the Straits Times wants to carry on doing well, Maybe they should just buy Rice Media. <laughs> 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 Maybe they should buy uh, Mothership. Yeah. I mean, I thought that you mentioned it, if, if we talk about it, right? I mean, so there's this global narrative, which is like, oh, you know, media's tough times, but there are some winners, right? You know, and but they're really fair, rare and fair, far between, right? Which is, I think, the narrative that we've been reading from the Straits Times about <laughs> why, you know, they're struggling as a, as a paper. And I think that was a great analysis by, you know, Brian Chu, you know, kind of like the founder of uh, The Smart Local. And he was just basically saying like, hey, okay, but the other way to look at it is not that everyone is struggling and a few are, uh, are succeeding, but hey, a few are succeeding in the midst of all this change. And what differentiates them is the ability to do digital transformation. That's one level. And actually, there are lots of local media outlets that are doing well and profitable, like the Smart Local and uh, Mothership 
and, you know, rice, you know, uh, not everybody's obviously doing well, but, you know, obviously S gag is a form of news in its own way. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. I mean, you know, like if you read some of the stuff, you know, I think, you know, they're like, I think they get a core of the humor of a, of a news story really fast, like the second breaker announcements. And you do see those articles getting reshared or, or you know, done over and over again. Like, you know, like, um, I've definitely used the Smart Local for reviews of local products, you know, uh, similar to how I use Wirecutter for, uh, by the New York Times, right, in the States, uh, or Consumer Reports in the States. Um, I do use Mothership because, you know, people love to reshare Mothership articles as well as, uh, you know, Rice Media articles to, some, to a slightly smaller extent, right? Much um, smaller. So I've definitely seen the Straits Times articles getting reshared now that I think about it, unless it's mentioning their own company. Did, did you say that uh, you rarely or you often see the Straits Times articles getting reshared? Uh, rarely see Straits Times articles yeah. getting reshared from That's my perspective. True. Yeah. I, th I think you brought up a good point in the sense that they don't understand how to do digital as well, right? And right. at the end of the day, the main problem is if you look at something that's very, very mainstream and where the idea is to get a lot of clicks like a mothership, they do that very well. Or uh, for Rice, where they're doing very in-depth sort of thought pieces, which is very good and caters to a certain segment. But at the end of the day, right, they are catering to their reader. Yeah. And they want to, they're writing what people want to read about. But the difference with the Straits Times is they are pushing what they want onto the reader. And yeah. that's not appealing to anyone. So the Straits Times probably needs to uh, adapt, not just dig digitally, but culturally. And, um, they have a lot to figure out. Yeah. And the problem is the people they're putting in charge of this, I like to be proven wrong, but I, I don't think that, I think this would be a repeat of how when the American Congress summoned all the top tech startup CEOs. And <laughs> if you get my drift on this. Yeah. I think my, you know, I think the the way that it was framed was like the previous administration of the Straits Times uh, had neither done a digital industry nor done any successful transformation work. So they walked into a industry they thought was stable and going to keep going as it was for the past, you know, 100 years of dividends and profitability. Uh, and, you know, they didn't see the need and, uh, and eventually could not successfully execute uh, the two parts of it, which is understanding what it needs to be to become a digital uh, player. And then secondly, the successful transformation needed to do that, right? We're just investing in writers. We talked about it to create quality journalism, investing in the technical work needed to get clicks, um, investing in the reputational work uh, needed to expand the ambit from this uh, Singapore audience of a couple of million folks to being a regional player, right? Similar to Al Jazeera for Southeast Asia. Because I think in contrast, you know, you see Channel News Asia is doing pretty well, uh, you know, being that, uh, regional trusted source, right, of news, um, which is a quite an interesting dynamic, actually. Um, so I think it's something that I'm quite mindful about, and I think that's where Brian Chu's writing was pretty good, uh, was about that aspect of there are successful local benchmarks that are digital players, um, and you know, MediaCorp has also made that transition as well, actually, uh, because I've definitely watched a lot of content by their team actually on YouTube as well, to be honest, you know, I think I was reading, watching one on air fryers and if they're healthy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> another one was whether intermittent fasting works. Uh, and then another one was like walking around Singapore. Uh, this by MediaCorp? You know, so yeah, MediaCorp, yeah. Oh, wow, okay. And of course, I think this, we see some independent journalism. We saw it, for example, with uh, SudhirTV.com. Uh, He's a independent journalist. He was a previous podcast episode here we'll link it to it in the show notes um and he's i think his approach is very much like what you just said right which is you know he has a very specific niche and he appeals people of that niche to come in and listen to what he's saying right i think bertha hansen is another independent journalist right who has a very clear point of view and she has a ton of clicks and views of what she's doing and in some ways it's interesting where she's more successful as an independent influencer and thought leader versus her previous work to build at a time the middle ground right which was uh 
the attempt to build a centrist uh, newspaper. Um, so I think there's a very different approach where you're like um, best of breed of different uh, niches and then putting them together under one stable versus uh, a lowest common denominator approach for the masses, which uh, is very different. Yeah. But at the same time, like you know, do you, do you think the Straits Times should be going regional or should be competing on those levels when it's not in their DNA? Because the way I see it is, the more I think about it right now, now that you're forcing me to think about it, what's the Straits Times good for? Um, I mean, other than, than, than food reviews, they're good for relaying important news to the public, right? A, and B, reporting on very local news. And this is something that people are going to be interested in reading, uh, no matter what, no matter like you know how international, how no matter how uh, how good other stuff uh, there is out there. So maybe at the end of the day, we we should just make it a. I mean, it's already halfway there, right? It should be a public utility, <laughs> and uh, the government should just pay for it. And if you want anything on on COVID or like you know crime scenes in Singapore or like, you know, how the, um, if Indonesia is burning their forests and like, you know, what's the PSI index, you just go to the Straits Times. Maybe that's its fate. <laughs> Oof. No, no, I, I'm, I'm not trying to be yeah, insulting. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not trying to be insulting down here, but I'm saying like, you know, you want to be, fo- you want to focus on what you're good at, right? And uh, it's a skill to present all this sort of information in a accurate manner. And they have no incentive to... They don't have if if you remove the profit incentive from them, and all they have to do is just report news accurately without and removing the journalistic sort of element from it. That's what they've been really good at, and that's what people turn to them for, right? No, do you do you really go to the Straits Times for anything, uh, thought provoking or journalistic? It's mostly for the reporting, right? Oof. No, I'm not trying to be insulting again. So, <laughs> I'm just saying that's where the core competency is. I agree that uh, so so local news is one of. The... <laughs> I mean, okay. I agree that local news is one of the pillars of what they're good at, right? And they, and there is a clear need for it, right? Because if I want to know what's happening in terms of the local murder at Block Five Five Four Five Seven, like no one else is going to report about it, right? Which is interesting to everybody in not just obviously. At block four five seven, but also the whole block, the whole area, and the whole country, right? And it's never going to be reported in New York Times because one murder is not a very dramatic thing in from New York Times article's <laughs> perspective, right? You know, whereas in Singapore is like, whoa, like you know, how many murders are there in a year, right? Yeah, uh, it's actually a, you know, you know, what there was a gun involved, you know, like that's probably like wow, that's like really amazing because. You know, there are so few of those events that happen a year, right? So I think there's something around that nichiness of that local news that obviously there's continues to be demand, but also continues uh, to be some nichiness to do something in. Uh, so I think there's that. It's just that I think you have that core and you still have that capability to be beyond that. I mean, at minimum, you should be targeting the Singaporean diaspora, right? <laughs> you know, as well. Um, and then, you know, I think you also need to be targeting different tiers of the Singapore reading audience, right? Because, you know, I think even like the Singapore market in terms of newspaper, there's only two tiers, right? There's, there's free, <laughs> a certain number of articles per day. Uh, and then they have a introductory tier into some sort of longer term digital subscription. And I think they have a paid newspaper thing that's kind of happening in parallel. And then I think you're kind of missing a third tier, which is like what we talked about, which is you're not just paying you know, 20 bucks a month or whatever it is, but you're paying, paying like 50 to 100 bucks a month, right? But that stuff needs to be super solid, right? Um, and I think that's what I think. I feel like, yeah, in the Singapore, it continues to be a financial hub uh, for Southeast Asia. I think it continues to be a driver of a lot of financial activity, a lot of startup activity. Um, I don't see why we have to be defeatist uh, about, you know, the Straits Times capabilities to broaden that out. But I do agree with you that that may not be the strategy that is going to be undertaken uh, moving forward. I want to clarify, I'm not being defeatist down here. It's just being focused, realistic. Because if you think about it, 
I mean, you've mentioned unbundling a few times, right? And what happens when something gets unbundled? Uh, people get very good at their niches. And a few of those people that you've mentioned, some of their work is truly outstanding. And I mean, sad to say, I've not seen that quality of work from the Straits Times in the, in the last whatever, ever, I, I don't know. <laughs> but I know what I go to the Straits Times for. So in a time when everything's unbundled, maybe you should focus on what you're really good at. Hmm. If not, if you don't focus, you're just going to get slaughtered, right? Because we are living in this world. So, so these are the two people who are pitching at the board meeting right now, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. What is we, we got to continue cost cutting? Screw this deep writing. Let's focus on block four four five B, uh, four four five seven murders. <laughs> yeah, you know, and let's focus on that and more press releases. <laughs> And then I have the guy who is like, we need to go regional. We need to win on the business users and, and you know, have more like price tiers and innovate and have better writers. Is that, is, do you think that's a fair, like, you know, comparison of our positions? Okay. What I would like to say is if I was working at the Straits Times, I would never say what I'm saying now. I would go with your approach because the board is never, ever going to swallow what I'm suggesting. I'm saying between two friends down here, I think like, you know, that's probably what they should do. Although realistically speaking, knowing like, you know, who's on the board of the Straits Times, they're not going to go for that. I mean, it's just too much of an ego, ego crusher, right? I feel like it's the opposite. I, I think that if I was the Straits Times, I would not say what I just said. Because I want to keep my job and to say we focus on what we're doing because, you know, the, it feels like a more straightforward path to, you know, slash your way to profitability, right? I mean, you know, if it worked for NOL, why wouldn't it work for <laughs> times uh, <laughs> Slash S, you know? I don't know. You know? Me, can you imagine, like, you know, these these government scholars on the board, like, you know, they're being pitched that and they're listening. Yeah, let's reduce the straits times to to this. Food reviews and local news, and no, no journalism, just straight out reporting. And the digital element of it is, people probably just have an app and they just get some daily updates. It'd be like a COVID update app, but then like you know you just get some bit of local news. It's very unappealing, right? But you know if you look at BBC and NPR, right? I mean that's a lot of their bread and butter, right? Nobody in a, in in Southeast Asia listens to NPR. Uh... But, you know, Americans listen to NPR, right? Which is massively government uh, subsidized and funded, right? Uh, and then you look at BBC. I mean, sure, we read a lot. You know, my dad used to like, you know, switch on the radio to BBC, right? Because, you know, Lee Kuan Yew was like, we need to have BBC and we need to keep it on air uh, no matter what, you know? And so my dad would always, you know, in the car, would always be like, you know, tune to BBC. I can't remember the startup sound, right? You know, it's like, this is the BBC, you know? Uh, and he was just tuning in all the time for the BBC news, right? But if you look at BBC news or so, that, you know, they talk heavily about everything from a very Anglo uh, perspective, but they do the local news and they also do the, uh, the global take, right? I don't know. I feel like this, I feel like maybe I'm even more optimistic is that I feel like there's an audience for a Singaporean point of view on the world, you know, that's like independent, not too American, not too Chinese in, uh, you know, focusing on, obviously Singaporean news is one pillar. I think a single, a regional take, a China's News Asia take, investigative or clear journalism in a region, and a Singaporean take, a pan-Asian take on uh, the world news. My optimistic point of view uh, now that you've painted me as a eternal pessimist. <laughs> 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 My optimistic point of view is that I think what Singapore does very well is that we straddle East and West uh, pretty well, right? And even more so than, let's say, an Asian American who... Uh, who has probably whose parents are from China and they grew up in the U.S. At the end of the day, they still have a lot of an American perspective. I think the nature of being a small country and the way that our country was structured was that our bread and butter is being able to straddle both cultures well, and not only that, we don't really have a real stake to take sides from the U.S. or China, right? The the, the two big boys. We're kind of uh, that small boat in these two cruise liners. 
And our point of view, right, is what's very needed in the world today, where it's very polarized. I think our point of view is the centrist point of view. And if anything, I think maybe that's an opportunity for a Singapore media entity to push. Yeah. You know, I think there, there's something to it. You know, I just feel like, you know, this again, I say maybe I'm just, this is like what, just the, <laughs> you know, there's a happy ending. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, you know? maybe. What would the happy ending look like for the Straits Times? That's a good question, right? I mean, in my brain, it's like Al Jazeera uh, for the region, I would say. That's how I think about it. I mean, I read Al Jazeera for Al an alternative take to New York Times as well as other, you know, like uh, Washington Post. Washington Post, yeah. Yeah, probably, and BBC. I think Al Jazeera does some really good investigative journalism. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously I don't pay for them uh, in this case, uh, but I can see, like, if I was, like, much more intertwined with the, the region and the topics, I would, you know, definitely be a regular subscriber in that sense. So, yeah, BBC or Al Jazeera for the region probably be the happy ending. Um for you know everybody involved, like you know the prince is you know Kabul one, you know uh, to save the day, right? Maybe, maybe let's hope so. I think they'll have to find a way to attract the best talent to work for them. Um, yeah, Singapore government has always found a way to do that. Maybe there'll be a maybe there'll be a scholarship. Maybe some government scholars will want to be reporters for the Straits Times instead of working at the EDB. Find like you know the best brains to work on that. Give them the freedom to operate. Boom, Singapore becomes the Al Jazeera for Southeast Asia. Yeah, I, I think so. I think there's a, str a strong possibility, right? Uh, at least that's what I think. And uh, I think there's a lot of great talent, in, and I hope they also pull in some talent from the local digital players, right? You know, start poaching some people, I guess, from Rice and Smart Local and Ooh. everybody. You know, and well, then go multi, uh, go multi uh, channel. Uh, because, you know, if they produce something on an article, doesn't mean that, you know, like you, what you and I know now, which is you can also go via podcast, you can go via YouTube, right? The same content can travel many different ways. Um, and also like you and I both know, and we've heard multiple times that Straits Times digital uh, capabilities are also pretty weak technically, right? So, you know, sometimes we talk about the big strategy piece, but also, you know, if you're just not doing A-B testing regularly <laughs> or uh, having the fundamental like, you know, thoughtfulness around what makes a good headline for the digital age and how to gate and treasure properly, uh, you, you know, it's also a big problem as well. That's very true. Um, actually, one company they can learn from is the SCMP. Uh, the SCMP, the current CEO is, uh, I can't remember his name, but he was the former CEO of Dig, actually, obviously after Kevin Rose, and I think he headed Sp Spotify's Innovation Lab or, or something like that. And he's managed to turn um, their fortunes around. And I'm not sure if you follow the SCMP, but I think they produce some pretty good stuff. Uh, they clearly got a very bright guy who understands how a consumer tech business should operate and media, actually, in the modern day and age. So I think the first step for the Straits Times, if they were to go down that route, at least, would probably be to bring in a, a big heavyweight like that to transform the company. Yeah. Um, Who would you get? The SCMP guy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, if you, I mean, you want to buy someone who's done it before, right? Right. You know, you know, the perfect world, you always try to say, have you done the exact same thing before for the exact same type of company, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Which is a digital transformation. Uh, of a uh, flagship newspaper, right? Uh, in this case, SCMP is great. Maybe someone from Al Jazeera, but I think SCMP probably would be a little bit more palatable, I think, <laughs> for yeah. uh, as an owner, I think. Um, I think there's a lot of great talent out there, honestly. I think uh, we just have to look be okay with that. Well, not we, but yeah. <laughs> it's like you and I actually it's like we go off and it was just like yes with our dinky podcast and newsletter audiences and we're like yep I think we should start a movement like you know you should get all your guests and like you know I'll get all my readers to like go behind this maybe we can do something well the truth is there's a lot of great emerging journalists and writers out there content creators and just doing it themselves you know so let me ask you a question who do you think is going to win the smart local <laughs> or the Straits Times? In terms of? 
but whatever way you try to decide it. I think if I were to bet on who readers in Singapore prefer to read or who they turn to when it comes to more entertainment sort of news in Singapore, yeah, I guess the smart local will win by a mile. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, of course, today, by 10 years. You know. Oh, 10 years! <laughs> Jeez, I mean, obviously, uh, now we, everybody knows what answer <laughs> is, you know? <sighs> 10 years a bit too far ahead. Let's let's talk five. Five years, I'd still say the smart local. And five I'll tell years. you why. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think 10 years is a bit too hard to, to, to project. I always say like, you know, three to five is a bit more realistic. Because looking at who they brought on to the Straits Times, right? It's more of the same. So I, I don't think the thinking is going to change very much. And the smart local guy, uh, Brian, Brian Chu, right? Yeah. I, uh, I met him like about 10 years ago. A smart guy. And he he's young. He understands how things work, very focused. And I don't think you can compete with that unless you bring in someone like him. Yeah, yeah. Or you acquire him, I guess. <laughs> oh my, he would love that. I bet he would yeah. love that. It was like he yeah, take charge of digital. You know, love you. <laughs> <laughs> I think right now he's like. Right? Yeah, when this podcast episode comes out, we just said to him, say, hey, we think Straits Times should acquire you too. <laughs> That's our recommendation <laughs> to Straits Times. Like, in our very like considered, uh, you know, commentary slash expert recommendation, right? <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know what? We should probably start like, you know, a podcast together recommending acquisitions. <laughs> <laughs> I recommend acquisitions. <laughs> I mean, and like you said earlier, I think Straits Times might as well acquire Mothership, right? I mean, I probably read, I think Mothership has done a better job with infographics and its explanation of circuit breaker restrictions than the Straits Times by far. On WhatsApp, I consume so much Mothership stuff because, you know, Mothership has the articles on the pulse, I think, on what people are actually thinking about today, right? You know, and writing it today, totally. right? You know, like authors eating fish. <laughs> like in someone's totally. you know, backyard and I'm like yeah that's that's highly engrossing and material that's you know not a murder of a gun at block 457 but it's really interesting well I think because they get to publish whoever they want right at the end of the day and my suspicion is you have some very smart people in the Straits Times who are equally cheeky like the people at Mothership but they whatever they want to write probably just doesn't Past editorial verification, right? Or vetting, so to yeah. speak. I think the assumption here is just like, if you're building something for a certain number of pages of newspaper, you need to have all the various teams write a certain amount of copy. And then those that make the cut, make the cut. And those that don't make the cut, don't make the cut, right? Uh, but and I think in the online world where there's no limit to how much paper you can print <laughs> because it's a web page, it's all bits, you know, you should just publish everything you write, no matter how weird or no matter how quirky it is. Uh, it's just a matter of packaging it in a way that it finds its audience, right? Uh, and gets there and gets reshared. Yeah, but at the same time, you, you can't imagine the, the Straits Times has a certain image to uphold, right? So they're not going to publish things that are too quirky. I think that is the problem. And pe people don't want to read bland shit nowadays, I think. Well, that would have made it on the Straits Times podcast, but, you know, here you can go ahead, right? So for those who want that little juicy exclamation, <laughs> you know, there you go. <laughs> awesome. Uh, so uh, last thing to wrap things up, you know, what tip would you have for content creators to be brave? To be honest... So I've spoken to quite a few friends who've wanted to start writing and a lot of them don't start. And to be honest, I, it took me a few weeks to get started as well because you write something and you look at it and you're like, oh, this, this is not good at all. <laughs> so like, you know, it, it just, you end up with a Google Drive of half written um, pieces. And I think the most brave thing you can do is just to publish your work that you think is not that good because at the end of the day, most of us, we're just too harsh on ourselves, right? Awesome. Well, thanks so much. I appreciate you coming on the show. No, thanks for having me.
I really appreciate it. I think, um, you know, three parts that we talked about, right? So the first part is your personal experience as a founder and how that translates as advice to first-time founders and, you know, some of the mythology and the real reality of it. Uh, the second thing I really appreciated was uh, your personal journey in terms of content creation and your personal taste uh, as uh, John Mayer uh, as a writer <laughs> and your thoughts about what the audience wants versus what you like to write versus you know what the best approach to thinking about it. And then thirdly, I enjoyed our little banter around Singapore Press Holdings and uh, how they would survive the great unbundling that's happening uh, in the digital media age and how um, there could be different approaches to it uh, for better or for worse. And hopefully there's a happily ever after uh, for the story uh, for you know for all perspectives and uh, we'll see how it goes in the future. Well, thank you for having me. You've been a very good host and I've enjoyed our banter and uh, the opportunity to share my experiences. Thank you for listening to Brave. If you enjoyed this podcast, Please share this episode with friends and colleagues. Sign up at www.jeremyow.com to discuss this episode with other community members in our forum. Stay well and stay brave. Stay brave.